I'm excited that the field is, I think, evolving in that direction of recognizing that evidence um, transcends, um, you know, uh, you know, rigorous randomized controlled trials. There are other ways of knowing things. We are always going to be more likely to see better results um, if we are grounding ourselves um, in in issues that um, our communities are excited and um, empowered um, to solve themselves and, and that they are gonna put their support behind. Um, and that's a really important form of evidence in and of itself um, are those lived experiences that, that folks on the ground are having. I'm JB Wogan from Mathematica and welcome back to On The Evidence. On this episode, we're going to talk about the investments we make in human capital and how we can do a better job of evaluating whether those investments are having the impact we want. An important piece of context for this episode is the COVID-19 pandemic. Early evidence suggests the pandemic took a toll on student learning, employment, physical and mental well-being, and the impacts were worse for communities of color and communities experiencing poverty. Not surprisingly, foundations, public agencies, and nonprofits around the country have sprung into action to mitigate those impacts. But how will we know if current efforts are working? We'll need data, and we'll need those data to paint a holistic picture in a way they typically don't today. But our guests for this episode are working on ways to make the data more useful for gauging which policies, programs, and practices are moving the needle in advancing equity from cradle to career. Our guests for this episode are Keith White, Niobe Gonzalez, Sarah Kerr, and Ross Tilchin. Keith is the Director of Research and Effectiveness at the Public Education Foundation Chattanooga, a nonprofit that provides training, research, and resources to teachers, principals, and schools in Hamilton County, Tennessee. Niobe is a senior researcher at Mathematica, and she co-authored a recent report for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on the Education to Workforce Indicator Framework, which establishes a common set of metrics and data equity principles for assessing and addressing disparities along the pre-K to workforce continuum. Sarah is the Vice President of Education Policy Implementation for Results for America, where she leads Ed Research for Action, an initiative that fosters a more nuanced and effective application of evidence-based strategies by improving the quality, availability, and use of evidence in education. Ross is on the solutions team at Results for America, where he directs the Economic Mobility Catalog, an online resource that helps local government leaders identify and implement evidence-based strategies from early childhood education to workforce development that can advance economic mobility in their communities. I hope you find this episode useful. Niobe, we'll be talking about how state and local governments across the country can advance equity for their residents from their earliest years in preschool all the way to their time as adults in the workforce. But before we dive into solutions, let's define a couple of related problems. So first, why in 2023 are we especially concerned about inequities in education and the labor market? And second, why is data so important for diagnosing and treating the problem? Thanks, JP. Well, I think as you mentioned in your intro, uh, we really have come to a head when it comes to a set of disparities and inequities that were really already persistent, but you know have worsened as a result of the pandemic. Uh, we know because of the data that are available, uh, for example, that there are persistent learning losses. Even a couple of years out from the pandemic, we still know that students haven't fully recovered. But we only know that for students who are in tested grades, for example, we don't know actually the extent of the problem for students in early grades or later grades in which, you know, testing is not part of accountability systems. Um, and we know less too about students who, um, whose data maybe aren't disaggregated, such as students, um, who are English learners or students with disabilities. And so just that one example, um, sort of really shows us how important it is to have data to diagnose the problem. 
and instances in which we don't have data to fully diagnose it. And it's hard to know, you know, how to act and where to make the biggest difference if we can't really, you know, quantify the extent of the problem. Uh, I mentioned only learning loss, but we also know both from data and anecdotally that, you know, people have been affected in myriad other ways uh, from from social emotional learning, mental and physical well-being, you know, all the way into obviously like career and employment. And so I think now more than ever, we really do need holistic data to let us know how people are doing from cradle to career in order to then act and take action. Sarah, I want to turn to you now. When you're working with local education leaders through the Ed Research for Action initiative, what data issues do you encounter that prevent state and local education agencies from understanding, number one, the disparities that exist, and number two, which programs are most effective for addressing them? Sure. Great question, and thanks so much for having me here. I'm really excited to be a part of this conversation. Um, you know, interestingly, I'm not I'm not sure it's entirely um, or necessarily that education leaders have trouble understanding uh, the existence of disparities. I think in many ways, uh, it's you know the pretty robust data collection efforts that have taken place at the state level and at the local level um, in school districts and in schools themselves that are really shedding light on those disparities. Naomi just mentioned a few good examples. I think many of us have, have probably heard the expression "information rich, insight poor." I think that has run you know, rung true, certainly in my career as an educator first and now as a policy person. Um, this isn't to say, you know, that we can't improve our data collection efforts and disaggregation. Um, Niobe, you just mentioned a few really good examples of where we could improve. Um, but I do think the sort of collection and disaggregation of data has really come a long way. Um, I also think it's really hard um, for all of us to do the arguably heavier lifting of making sense of the dis disaggregated data that we're collecting um, and really triangulating those data with other um, valuable data points, including the lived experiences of uh, different individuals um, that were, you know, intending to serve kids, families, educators, et cetera. Um, you know, the folks who are represented in those data sets. And it's sort of in that sense making and triangulation where, you know, I think the super important work of determining which programs and strategies are most effective for which students and, and under what conditions are happening. Um, and so, you know, I think we've spent a lot of time over the last three plus years during the course of this pandemic, um, really helping school districts and state agencies do just that, you know, bringing the existing data um, to the table alongside with the, you know, existing programs and investments and really trying to make sense of the data in the context of the work that's happening and the investments that have been made um, and, and, and working with leaders to, you know, strengthen the programs that are already in place um, and consider based on those disaggregated data, you know, which students are being served well um, and which students are being, you know, served less well and, and how can we consider, um, you know, the data and the evidence together to um, determine new approaches that have both short and long-term uh, track record of effectiveness for the students they're focused on. Keith, let's turn to you now. Your professional bio says that your passion is, quote, turning data into information. When it comes to the kinds of education data you deal with in Chattanooga, Tennessee, what's the difference between data and information? And if you don't mind, give us an example. Sure, uh, and also thanks for, for having me. This is a great chance to, to chat with colleagues and I really appreciate uh, getting to be a part. Um, so when I talk about data, I talk about raw numbers and um, I often have to admit that I am an educational psychologist. So I deal with data, I do a lot of research, but I, I really come at it from a um, an individual point of view. So um, when I talk about information, I'm talking about uh, data with a backstory. Um, and an example locally would be uh, from tw in 2015, there was a certain way that the state uh, derived economic disadvantage. And it put us, our district, around 61% uh, on that metric, which is a you know, huge uh, metric in, in our field, obviously, the proxy for for uh, affluence or poverty. Um, the very next year, uh, that measure, uh, with no changes in the population or influxes of uh, <laughs> economic um, juice, uh, that measure was 36%, right? So the data told me that that 
it was almost cut in half. Right. Yeah, that's a big shift. Yeah, huge, huge shift. Sixty-one to thirty-six percent. You all are doing something right there. <laughs> uh, well, the you know the the whole the whole issue was that change in how things were being measured. And I won't get into to why it was changed or the implications of it. It was an effort to make things more equitable in terms of resource allocation. Um, but the the data uh, information distinction there was that the information that we were able to derive from that data was way more important, right? Because we use uh, economic disadvantage as an indicator for uh, how, how we um, target services, um, different awards, um, you know, just resource allocation in general. So instead of facing that local dramatic impact, uh, we got to be leaders in but really all, all we did was normalize right the the two data sets so people could see um practitioners could see that it wasn't that we had half as many uh, students who were facing issues related to, to poverty it was the metric had changed fundamentally um and uh, so the issues were still there and we were able to kind of uh, create a tool that helped them to see where students were in terms of that metric or where schools were. Um, and that's, that I think is a, is a, the, the best example of turning data into information, right? It digs a little deeper than just taking it as, uh, oh, it cut, you know, cut in half awesome, which isn't, <laughs> isn't an accurate response to that, uh, to that change. Yeah, I imagine it would also it would inform sort of the level of resources that policymakers think is required to address the problem if they thought that the problem had been cut in half versus uh, having the more clear-eyed assessment that no, it's just the metric had changed. Um, now, Yobi, uh, I want to turn back to you. As I mentioned in my intro, you're a co-author of a recent publication that lays out a framework for using data to promote equity and economic security for all. And this is a free and publicly available tool that people can use to understand current disparities and measure progress over time. So talk about why the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation commissioned the creation of this framework, who is meant to, who is meant to use it, and um, how they can use it. So I think, you know, collectively, um, we all believe in the power of data, but we also understand that existing data systems haven't always been designed with um, equity and action in mind. I mean, just historically, you know, a lot of the data that we collect was a response to accountability requirements, you know, hence why we have really good data on test scores and can say a lot about learning losses through test scores, you know, in the pandemic. Um, so I think the framework was really born out of, um, I think, both a belief in the power of data and an acknowledgement that more can be done to really kind of unleash that true power of data in, in order to um, serve students. And so uh, we worked with the um, staff from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and uh, Mirror Group, our data equity partner, along with leading experts from over 15 national and community organizations to develop what we truly do see as a framework for encouraging more equitable data use and ultimately um, ensuring that cradle to career data systems um, are set up to support students as they progress from early education through their career. Um, and so in terms of, you know, who can use the framework, I, you know, it really, I think it's, it's quite broad. I mean, the, you know, it can be anybody who uses uh, education to career data. Um, but we're really hoping that in particular, it will inform um, longitudinal data systems, because one of the goals that we have with the framework is to ensure that data systems are aligned from pre-K all the way into workforce, so that data can tell the full story of that journey from cradle to career. Um, and so I'll mention a little bit about how it can be used. Um, the framework is comprised of a couple of different components. Um, the first component is a set of essential questions, which we have sort of identified along with, you know, input from a number of um, stakeholders in the field as 
key questions that every longitudinal data system should be able to answer about students um, and their experiences. And so um, there, are, there are questions there related to um, students' experiences throughout pre-K through their career, um, but also about how the systems themselves are serving them and what the system conditions are. Um, then we have um, a component that we call the indicators. Um, there are 99 indicators that we recommend be collected. Again, those span the full pre-K to career continuum. And we have recommendations about how to measure them so that the data can be um, high quality and actionable and comparable. Um, then we have a component that we refer to as the disaggregates, which are a set of characteristics that we think it's really important to also collect so that the data can be disaggregated. Um, then we have a component that we refer to as the evidence-based practices, which is really now about, you know, taking data and, and thinking about how to use that data to take action and choose um, a practice that, you know, has a strong evidence-based and, and can address disparities. Um, and then uh, last but not least, uh, the framework includes a set of data equity principles um, that we really hope will guide data use through all of those steps that I just outlined. Um, we acknowledge that, you know, data by itself, um, you know, can be neutral or even sometimes, you know, can be harmful if not used um, ethically and carefully. And so um, we have put forth a set of data, data equity principles that we hope users um, we'll keep in mind when using data. It, it talks about things such as, for example, triangulating it with other data, which I think is a, is a point Sarah made, um, but also involving community and restoring them as their as the data experts, um, since they're the ones who are often giving the data and, and we're, you know, the ones interpreting it. So restoring them as data experts. So um, we really do see each of those components as being complementary, and we hope that Together, they can inform both the design of um, data systems as well as their use uh, to make the data more actionable and equitable. Ross and Sarah, I'd like to turn to you now and talk a little bit about the work that you all are doing at Results for America. So you both spearhead initiatives that help local leaders identify evidence-based strategies that they can implement in their communities to increase residents' access to opportunity. So could you talk a little bit about the intent behind the Economic Mobility Catalog and the Ed Research for Action initiative and how people are currently using these resources? Absolutely, JB, and thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Um, so the intent behind the Economic Mobility Catalog is to help local leaders identify and implement evidence-based strategies to improve upward mobility for their residents. So this is a very wide ranging resource. It contains uh, over 250 programs and strategies and quite a bit of overview sort of brief style information on those. It also contains 50 case studies that tell the stories of how particular jurisdictions have been able to implement strategies that have good evidence and improve outcomes for their residents. So we want this basically to be a place where local leaders go, where they can understand what the evidence says about a very wide range of strategies that have some bearing on upward economic mobility. So whether that's education, it's health, housing, justice and public safety, workforce development, you name it. If it has good evidence of impacting economic mobility in some way, we want it in the catalog. Uh, and then we want leaders to learn about the specifics of how they might actually implement those strategies. So what have experts said? What have practitioners said? What have uh, the folks really doing the work in communities around the country learned as they've implemented these strategies? And then we want to distill those learnings in ways that feel actionable for users of the catalog. So if they do choose to pursue a particular strategy, they have a pretty clear roadmap of what it's going to take to implement that strategy well and get the results that uh, they should be getting uh, by implementing according to best practice. So in terms of how folks are using the resource, uh, generally they're coming to it with a particular issue area in mind and they have uh, very practical questions like, okay, within my portfolio or within the uh, policy area that I've been assigned, what are the strategies that have good evidence? What does the evidence actually say about what should happen if I implement this? What's the impact going to be if I implement this well? What's it going to cost? What are the essential components of implementation? So essentially the catalog seeks to uh, anticipate those questions in advance 
answer them as best we can, and then inform practice as leaders are deciding between a range of strategies um, and then moving forward towards implementation. Okay, great. And can I ask one silly question, but just in case listeners aren't familiar with the phrase economic mobility or the term, do you have a layman's definition? How do you think about what economic mobility encompasses? Sure, yeah. So um, uh, broadly speaking, we see economic mobility as the likelihood that a child born to a family with a low income is able to ascend um, uh, the socioeconomic ladder over the course of their lifetime. Of course, there are other components of economic mobility or upward mobility, I should say, that aren't just captured by uh, income. Uh, things like dignity, feelings of belonging, feelings of autonomy, being able to feel like you're in control of your own destiny. Um, but the more uh, strictly economic uh, focused definition would be the chances of a child born to a low income family rising up that socioeconomic ladder over the course of their lifetime. Okay. And then the catalog is a place where people can find solutions within that area, which is very cool. It's a great website. I totally in endorse people checking it out. Um, Sarah, what about the Ed Research for Action initiative? Do you want to talk a little bit about what that is, what, what you do? Sure. I would love to. Um, I think there's some good connective tissue between the um, work we're doing with Ed Research for Action and the work that Ross and his team uh, at, at RFA are doing with the Economic Mobility Catalog um, and a few key differences. So happy to share a little bit more about it, um, including uh, very briefly the origin story um, at the outset uh, which of, of Ed Research for Action, um, which was in the earliest and darkest days of the pandemic um, when we were all spending way too much time in our basements. Um, and I think many of us trying to figure out how to be useful in an impossibly difficult moment. Um, our big idea, uh, my co-founder co of Ed Research for Action and I's big idea, um, was to uh, broker trusted information about effective interventions and approaches between researchers and practitioners. Both Nate, my co-founder, and I have had, you know, one foot in the um, sort of practice world and one foot in the research world almost our entire careers. And so we've been kind of playing in that liminal space quite a bit. And we felt like um, at this moment, we recognized that um, education leaders, district leaders in particular, were charged with practically overnight figuring out how to quote unquote, do school in a dramatically different environment. And we knew that those leaders would you know, be making decisions um, often you know, super quickly, like I said, um, overnight having to figure out really difficult um, answers to tough questions. They were gonna be making those decisions one way or another. And we thought, um, you know, our hope was that we could um, bring relevant evidence to bear um, on the questions that they had. Um, and we believe that if we could give them access to sort of easy to find, um, digest and apply research, it would increase the chances that those decisions that they made about, you know, supports that they were putting into place, um, you know, for kids and, and educators, they'd be more likely to to make a difference and, and um, positively impact the experiences kids were having at that point in time. Um, so that was kind of our big idea. And I think in many ways, you know, three years later, that mission still holds true. You know, our, our briefs and other resources are really aimed at making, um, you know, often complex um, uh, and conflicting, <laughs> frankly, research um, more useful and therefore more likely to be used. Um, you know, I think I'll mention one important way I think we've evolved over time over the course of these three years, um, uh, which is, I think, hopefully reflective of the direction that education research in general is heading, um, is that we now, I think, have a better understanding of where states and districts are and are able to meet them there. And by that, I mean, um, we have found that states and school districts aren't always looking um, to data and research to tell them what to do, especially right now, three years into the pandemic, um, three years of federal relief dollars have flowed to districts. They've made um, a series of investments and they're you know, midstream or even quite a bit down the road of implementation. Um, what we've learned is that there are real opportunities for data and research to inform, not just on the front end, what should we do, but how do we um, take ongoing data collection and research, um, take stock of what we're doing and really understand how we can strengthen um, the implementation efforts. I think I heard, you know, um, all of all of the panelists or all of the podcast participants hit on the importance of implementation. And I think that has really been um, an important evolution of the Ed Research for Action initiative. And we're spending a lot more time um, focused on using data and evidence to better understand whether and to what extent um, the investments in um, evidence-based approaches are 
uh, in fact, making a difference and where they're not, um, you know, using those same data and evidence to kind of uh, drive um, either improvement of the initiatives they're already investment invested in or, you know, um, new investments. We do this in a couple of ways, including through our Act on Evidence Toolkit, which I won't dive into the details of today, but basically takes the underlying research that we all have access to that exists in our brief and kind of turns it on its side and gives leaders a set of look-fors um, to help you know, understand the existing investments that they've already made in programs that are in place. Um, just a few weeks ago, one of our um, close partners in a small district in Massachusetts, he's an assistant superintendent, um, was telling us about how he's using that, that Act on Evidence Toolkit as a summer planning tool with his principals as they go into next year. They're taking stock of all of the work that they've been doing in the past couple of years and thinking about, um, you know, their existing um, student data paired with community input, paired with research evidence and using that as kind of a stock taking tool as they think about um, the coming year and what they really need to do to, you know, in this sort of final year of federal relief funding in particular, what they need to do um, to make a difference for kids right now. Um, and so that's a little bit of a flavor for what we've been doing um, much more on our website, but uh, so hopefully the highlights are really helpful. Yeah, th th that's, that's really interesting. I, I was in preparation for this interview, I was uh, looking through the website and I read uh, one of the case studies about a school district in Rhode Island that was trying to adapt e evidence on summer summer learning to the, the their resources to, you know, they, they couldn't necessarily do everything that the evidence suggested you have to do. And they also wanted it to match kind of what with the local conditions and and uh, what the community wanted to do. And I thought that was a really interesting case study in terms of um, exploring where the rubber meets the road, you know, uh, being aware of what the evidence says is the ideal or best practice, and then being able to implement something that is somewhat faithful to that, but is also reflective of of the real world and the local conditions. Uh, is there anything else you want to say so am I am I capturing that correctly? I hope I'm not stealing your thunder for something you wanted to talk about later on in the in the show. Um, you actually sort of are, but I'm happy oh, okay. to. I, we can cut that if you like. No, no, we can speak to you. no. And later, no. I think it's a, it's a great point, and I think it's a really important point. And I imagine you know my fellow podcast uh, uh, panelists would agree that um, I think part of what we've we've learned and are hoping to you know kind of meet districts and states and, and schools where they are is that um, you know the evidence is super important and the data is always super important, but it's only part of the story when it comes time to, for districts and schools to be making decisions. And so we're really trying to work with, with um, our partners to first and foremost ground whatever they're doing in their local context. Um, what are the needs of students? Goes back to the dis disaggregated data. Um, what resources and capacity do you have? Um, what support in your community exists for the kinds of things that you're trying to do? Um, and then, you know, Given that context, looked the evidence, and I think part of what we've tried to do with um, you're referencing, I think the Woonsocket case study in Rhode Island. Um, you know, they used one of our what we call our design principles briefs, which really takes a highly evidence based strategy in this case, summer learning programs, and breaks it down into kind of the key characteristics of the program. If you are someone trying to implement, these are kind of the ten or so things that um, need to be true about your program based on the research evidence as you're thinking about design and implementation. Um, we recognize that given your context, you might not be able to, you know, do 100% of those 10 things um, well, or it might not make sense for you to do it. And so we're trying to derive from the evidence where, um, if this makes sense, where it's important to sort of hold tight and where you can let go a little bit and, and be looser in your design and align with the local context. And so it might come up later in the conversation, but um, I'm glad you you picked up on that point. We had a lot of fun working with that district. I did want to ask Sarah and Ross about equity because it's so important to the work that Niobe, Niobe is leading uh, with the framework. And I was curious to what extent when you're curating strategies, are you focusing on advancing equity? Is that is that a central part or is that a consideration in the strategies that you're putting on, uh, that you're highlighting through either initiative? Uh, I'm happy to take this one first. And the short answer is yes, this is a really important part of the content that we're creating in the Economic Mobility Catalog. And I think that uh, 
what Sarah was just saying is a nice example of how we see sort of the broad approach of the economic mobility catalog. And then we have a few areas where we focus on equity even more specifically. So fundamentally, we think that every strategy in the catalog, when uh, designed to meet local conditions, when uh, put together in consultation with community, adapted in all of the ways that it should be adapted to meet a particular population, uh, can be a means of advancing equity. These are strategies that are proven to uh, produce better outcomes that contribute to economic mobility. Greater economic mobility uh, is uh, creating a pathway towards equity. So these strategies, when they are designed correctly, can produce more equitable outcomes. Um, more specifically, we have a range of strategies. Uh, they all sit within um, our uh, outcome area, it's called racial equity in government, that are a little bit more process oriented, uh, that local leaders can look to as a way of changing the way that they do business essentially to produce more equitable outcomes. So these are strategies like inclusive procurement. This, this is equitable employment practices when you're hiring for the public sector equity focused budgeting practices when budget season rolls around, those sorts of things. So we have full briefs on all of those strategies as well. And then across all of our strategies, so there are uh, 53 strategy briefs within the resource, all of those pages have uh, an implementation best practices section. And many of those best practices have to do with uh, implementing said strategy in a way that is equitable. Um, I guess I should also say that we're excited to expand this content even more. So over the course of the next six months to a year or so, we're going to be working with uh, strategy specific experts to deepen that content even more in those implementation best practices. So this is even more at the forefront of the resource. Okay. And Sarah, was there anything in terms of that you want to flag in terms of Ed Research for Action and the way that you all think about equity? Sure, and I'll be brief um, to you know share the air with other folks on this issue. I think Ross had a lot of, of points that are coming in terms of the way we think about this on the ed research side of the house. Um, you know, I think we often you know we talk about how it's not just about you know average effects or, or outcomes overall, but really um, you know supporting our partners to think about you know how the evidence what about the evidence as it applies to specific groups of students and school personnel and specific needs. Um, you know, many, many studies, um, far too many, I think, report on average effects versus effects on, on specific kinds of learners. And so we work with our research authors, um, you know, as, as we're producing briefs to, um, you know, try and to the extent possible, identify um, relevant research for target populations um, and really work hard to isolate and report on subgroup impacts. Um, and we also try and hold ourselves accountable for not recommending strategies that haven't been widely tested and therefore you know, can be sort of safely considered as reliable and generalizable to, to entire populations. And so I'm like veering on the edge of getting into really technical issues, which I don't think we want to necessarily do today, but um, it's really important to us in the context of the work we do with our research partners to um, help them understand that the folks in the field, school leaders, um, you know, district leaders, state leaders um, are really committed necessarily to um, to equity. And that means being incredibly thoughtful about um selecting approaches that are not, um, that have been sort of studied and proven to be effective for the kinds of, of learners that they're prioritizing and trying to support. So lots of technical pieces um, and components of that, but um, hopefully we're able to kind of tease that out in a way that feels simple and straightforward and accessible to leaders who are, I think, really trying to do the right thing and make sure that they're picking, um, you know, things to invest in that are go going to make a difference for, for um you know, those students and families that are, are most important to serve and who have, I think, arguably over the last three years been most adversely impacted by the um, effects of school closures and the pandemic overall. Keith, I want to turn to you. Uh, we've been talking about local partners. You're on the ground in, in uh, Tennessee uh, and you've been involved. So you, you've been involved uh, specifically at the local level and working to link data systems across sectors so that people understand the current student experience from pre-K through the workforce and have the information they need to take action. Um, if you don't mind, talk about what data you've linked together and, and why you've done that. And then I want to circle back to the next part, which is making that data useful. So we act on some school officials for our local districts and focus a lot of our attention in, in that role 
on uh, linking high school experience data, high school performance data with post-secondary data. Um, we we look at the entire uh, you know pre-college pathway. Uh, they really put most of our attention on grades nine through twelve, and then uh, into post-secondary. So you know enrollment persistence, completion. Um, and that is important to us because that's, uh, first of all, it's not part of an accountability model. Uh, so it doesn't always get a lot of attention. Um, and so that's a, a driver for us. And we're a very equity focused organization. And, you know, we were, we were seeing um, there were uh, lots of gaps uh, after high school, right? So, uh, which obviously has you know workforce implications, um, but for our, for our students, just quality of life implications. We take that information and share it with the district, share it with higher ed partners. Um, we have, uh, you know, we're we're in the Hamilton County, Tennessee, so we have uh, a local uh, public two year and a local public four year. Uh, plus, we're you know uh, right in the middle of the UT system, so um, most of our students uh, stay in state and end up uh, in in that um, in that space, one one of those spaces. Um, and we use the information internally as well for you know we have a college guidance programs and we have uh, student internship programs um, and we have data sharing agreements with both our local uh, universities so we're able to really dive in and look at the student, student pathways and experiences. And is there is there any, can you think of any kind of illustrative example of how once you've linked the data systems, uh, how it's led to some kind of policy or programmatic change? Is there a, a success story you like to share? Sure. So I mentioned equity is a big deal. So we do lots of disaggregation. And um, over the years, you know, we, we saw um, as we worked on predictive models and early warning systems, um, we saw uh, lots of students undermatching which just means they were either not going to post-secondary after high school when they could have, or they were entering uh, a higher ed institution that um, was was good, but they could have gone uh, to a school where they had a better chance of success, uh, which we measure by completion. So they would, you know they would have graduated with a degree within six years. Um, because we saw undermatching, um, we you know not only looked at the data, but also talked to students uh, about you know reasons for this. And um, even though um, it was a long process that I won't get into, uh, the, the bottom line was they not all students were getting all of the information. Not all students were getting uh, the information they needed to make great decisions or informed decisions about where to go uh, to college. Uh, or what to do after high school. So we um, took that knowledge and that information and used it to develop a, a post-secondary match and fit app. Um, you know, we, we've got over 20 years of post-secondary pathway data, and uh, which is kind of a nightmare, but also great because, <laughs> because we're able to uh, to to use that to build some predictive models uh, that allow us to not have to dip into that data very very often. So if a user, a student, gives us their information, we're able to help match them uh, with a great school. So we look at ac academic match um, and a personal fit and give them a list of schools at which they're going to have a greater chance of success. Um, obviously that's, that uh, comes with, um, a lot of guidance, comes with a lot of support for, we have an embedded advisory system, which comes into play as well. So it's not like we just, you know, say there's your list, 
uh, enjoy. I mean, there's, a, there's a lot of hand holding uh, and a lot of uh, agency as well uh, that we give the student. Uh, but but I consider it a victory because it really did level the playing field in terms of who was getting what information when they were getting it, um, and you know opened up uh, opened up the entire menu of post secondary options. Uh, whereas you know so some of our students from most challenged schools were um, you know elections were funneled, uh, but that's what was happening. They were you know being either dismissed or. Uh, just summarily sent to to one or, or two locations without really much thought to fit, match, chance for success, anything like that. So, and that was not okay with us. So that that uh, that app is something that we're really excited about. Um, the the negative part about the app is that we released it early in 2020, so, so we're still trying to collect good uh, data on how effective it is uh, and it's useful to some the field. So as you can imagine, um, that wasn't a great time to release a college match and fit app. Well, it still sounds like it's, it has sort of obvious, <laughs> powerful potential. Um, I, I, I think it'd be interesting to, to follow up and hear, hear what data you collect about its effectiveness. Um, I, I think one, one other question I had for you, Keith, was uh, because you know this framework that Naomi mentioned earlier that Mathematica is working on with Mirror Group and um, for the the Gates Foundation, um, you know it it is trying to uh, gather data more equitably and also gather data on equity. Um, what are the equity implications that come with changing the way we collect and use these data? Are there any? Any sort of general principles or, or examples you can think of in, in, in how you've dealt with this in Chattanooga? For us, it's really about what I would call just doing good research. I'm not, um, not coming into the situation with um, bias or um, predetermined. Uh, opinions, I, I guess. Um, and the reason why I, I put it in that way is that, that we were seeing with our students that they had been categorized in a way. So I might have uh, a profile for them. You know, we have all this information, uh, working with the district, working with higher ed institutions, and their profile looks amazing. It's exactly the same as someone who would go uh, persist and succeed. Um, and for whatever reason, they would be put in the, uh, you know, by a, usually a, a, some grant up along the way. Um, don't want to indict, <laughs> don't want to indict any systems or, or people, but some grant up along the way would say, well, you're not college material. You're, you know, you're just not a college kind of person or your brother wasn't a, a college person. You're not a college person. That's not for you. Um, all, you know, all the, all the things. We've all heard um, in in the field, I'm sure. So because of that, uh, and, and also the knowledge that um, if you're from an affluent school in Chattanooga, you're three times more likely um, to graduate from college with a degree than if you're from an economically challenged school, um, which is huge, right? Like that's. Um, that's amazing, uh, an amazing difference, a huge, not, not in a good way. So leveling that playing field, making sure that um, no matter what school you go to, uh, no matter what one specific person or group of people might say about your path or your future or your potential, um, arming students with information and, and the, the advocates that work with them with good information, that, that's how we get at equity. And, and to do that, we have to really just um, not only use the information internally, but also use it with the students, with their parents. Um, it kind of circles back to the answer, my answer to the first question. It's all about the conversation. Uh, so, you know, data, 
it's can set cold, but information is meant to be shared, talked about, uh, used. Um, and for us, that is the greatest equity lever is, you know, when you're able to show a student, you know, when they say, oh, I just not college material, to show them that, well, actually, if you look at other kids from your school who have gone and succeeded, you are uh, perfect for college material. And, you know, just to see that uh, switch flip and their eyes light up a little bit or their parents kind of realize, oh, really? And then, you know, you get to see them or it could change paths completely. Um, as far as that's the, that's the best kind of equity, right? Yeah, what what a what a nice distillation of the power of data and in a and the human impact there. Um, I can see the the I can visualize a, a child's eyes lighting up, uh, lighting up. Um, I want to wrap up by looking to the future, and I'll put this question to each of you: What do you consider the next frontier or phase in leveraging data to advance equity across this? continuum from education through the workforce uh, what still needs to change or for, you could take this different ways what 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 still needs to change or perhaps where do you see an emerging trend that gives you hope about using data to inform strategies on the ground and Naomi, I'm hoping you can start us off here sure um, well it's it's hard to believe but currently fewer than 20 states actually have longitudinal data systems that connect data from pre-K, K-12, post-secondary, and workforce, which enables, you know, the kind of data use that we've been talking about. Um, so there, you know, is still a long way to go. Um, but on the other hand, I think we are at a time of opportunity. Um, there's uh, several states, almost 30, that have proposed using federal funds from the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund to either link their data systems or make other um, improvements to their data systems. Um, and so it does feel like, you know, now is a time when people are thinking about the power of data and trying to go beyond uh, kind of what we've been doing, which, um, you know, again, you know, was sort of really focused on accountability for a long time and now trying to go beyond that. Um, there are a couple of states that I think um, really serve as, as, you know, sort of promising um, case studies. Um, for example, both New Mexico and California um, have really been using um, an approach that is based on starting with essential questions, you know, working with stakeholders to identify what are the key questions that they want to be able to answer with their um, longitudinal data systems, and then using that to inform their data modernization efforts. Um, and so we hope that um, more and more um, states and communities will use that sort of approach, which we hope will help ensure that the data are more actionable. Because um, too often, you know, there's accountability and different rules and that sort of guides what data gets collected. And then that in turn guides what data gets used. Um, but we hope that by starting with, you know, the questions that really need to get answered in order for people to take action, um, you know, that that serves as a promising blueprint for making sure that data modernization efforts going forward, um, you know, are are leading to data that are more actionable and can support more equitable data use. Keith, what are you looking for? What do you think is next in in I don't know if you want to call it the fight, but in the in the in the push or the movement to advance equity uh, and using data to advance equity across this continuum of education to the workforce? We're going to see uh, not necessarily a shift, uh, but an addition of another set of ABCs. So, we, you know, we've, I talked about earlier about um, attendance, behavior, course completion, these very, uh, uh, you know, quantitative, uh, e relatively easy to measure things. Um, I think that we're going to need to get much, much better at measuring agency, belonging, connection, um, because, you know, I, we've had two decades now of uh, collecting some pretty high stakes information and we've learned, um, so I think, or hopefully we've learned or will learn that that did not give us all of the answers we need uh, to have actionable, equitable uh, systems. Um, so it's good news, Niobe, for all for all the states that don't have a system yet, 
they can just build those new APCs into their new system, into their new system, or maybe just start with agency belonging and connection and see if they even need all the other all the other metrics. I think that's that's where we're going. Um, and you know, in addition to you know fellow panelists uh, who are already doing that kind of work and thinking that way. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of great work out of University of Chicago as well. Um, they've they've got a great framework for that, um, and I think that's going to be where we uh, hopefully will be spending more time and attention. Ross, I, I remember actually you were when you were defining economic mobility. You were talking a little bit about the sort of the more broader the broader concept of mobility and and what's not necessarily captured in economic mobility, but in upward mobility, and it seems very consistent with some of the things that Keith is calling for being measured in the future. Um, anything else you would add in terms of the next phase, next frontier? What what's what needs to happen in the future in terms of using data to advance equity? Sure. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be increasingly focused on implementation here. So, uh, first of all, I think that the frontier has sort of changed with great resources like the one that Niobe and her team have created uh, that give leaders in government the ability to really assess the landscape of where they stand and then make much more informed decisions on where their investments should go. So uh, with the creation of this resource that we're talking about today, others like the Urban Institute's mobility metrics, uh, these are really powerful tools uh, that can enable government leaders to be making dramatically better decisions. So I think that the frontier has shifted uh, recently with that. But with the focus on implementation, I think that there, we're going to see a greater emphasis on trying to distill down sort of what Sarah and her team often do with Ed Research for Action. So what are those essential components of, let's say, an after school program or a summer learning program, social emotional learning curriculum in schools? What are those seven, eight, nine things that if you are making an investment in this strategy, you really need to have in place in order to get the intended effect? And once we're able to see more information on those core components, you know, stretching beyond just the educational realm, but into things like health or housing, workforce de development, you name it, that gives local government leaders a ton of leverage as they're making investments in these strategies where they can say to you know, during a procurement process, during a, a budgetary discussion on how to allocate funds uh, to a particular program, this is what we really need to have because this is what's going to generate results. So really excited to see more work uh, in that realm. Sarah, I want to give you the final word. And I know Ross is already, he talked a little bit about implementation that connects back to some of the comments you were making earlier, but is there anything else that you want to speak to in terms of um, the next frontier, what, what to look for in the future, what, what needs to happen now? and in the future for advancing equity through data. Sure. Always dangerous to give me the last word, um, but I'll, I'll see how I do. <laughs> I mean, I, I just want to like, you know, underscore, cosign a thousand percent, all of what everyone has already said. Um, so it's always lovely to be able to build on those ideas and walking away with um, new information. I love the new ABCs, um, Keith. So I'm, I'm a, I, I didn't, I, I understand those concepts and a hundred percent agree um, that that is part of the next frontier is really rethinking how we, um, you know, what we're collecting and how we're using that information to understand the entire you know, experience students are having and, 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 you know, use it to support them and predict how likely they are to be successful along their trajectory. So i um, excited to walk away learning something from this, not just that, but lots of things. Um, I, I want to double down on the implementation piece because it's just been so clear over the course of my 20 year career that that is really, um, you know, where we need to be more focused. You know, I think that there is historically has been less time and energy going into implementation than I think is ideal and that I think is necessary for all the reasons Ross and others have already said. Um, you know, I think even the most highly, I've seen it, right, myself, I've, I've been behind implementation of, you know, even the most highly evidence-based you know, solutions. And I've seen them fail um, because we didn't attend to the details of implementation. You know, do we have the adequate resources, the human capital, the community support? I want to just like triple underscore that. I think we've really come to understand the importance of, um, you know, starting this, Niobe, I think we're saying this and others, like start with the questions that communities are asking and the issues that they're seen and, and experiencing and the problems that they want to solve, um, I think we are always going to be more likely to see better results um, if we are grounding ourselves um, in 
in issues that um, our communities are excited and um, empowered um, to solve themselves and, and that they are going to put their support behind. Um, and that's a really important form of evidence in and of itself um, are those lived experiences that, that folks on the ground are having. And I think um, I'm excited that the field is, I think, evolving in that direction of recognizing that evidence um, transcends, um, you know, uh, you know, rigorous randomized controlled trials. There are other ways of knowing things. And I, I think I'm, I'm excited for the resources that are, are, are being put out by folks here and others that are, I think, I'm acknowledging that there are lots of different ways that we can come to know um, whether or not something is going to work for a certain population of, of folks. Um, includes includes causal evidence, but transcends that. I'm excited to see that, um, you know, be more widely understood and embraced and, you um, and, and couple that with, you know, sort of a, a relentless um, focus on implementation um, moving forward and, and building sort of those evidence building and continuous improvement uh, muscles um, and, and grounding them in, you know, the resources, the longitudinal data systems um, uh, that that um, states are, are investing money in moving forward. I think that's a great note to end on. There is no danger at all in giving you the last word, Sarah. So Sarah, Keith, Niobe, and Ross, thank you so much for your time today. Um, it's been a really great conversation and I will be sure to include various links to all the resources, the excellent resources, so other people can learn more about the framework and the economic mobility catalog and uh, the Ed Research Reaction Initiative and some of those case studies that we talked about today. Thank you so much. Thanks to our guests, Keith White, Niobe Gonzalez, Sarah Kerr, and Ross Tilchin. Any resources we discussed on this episode are available in the episode show notes. As always, thanks for listening to another episode of On the Evidence, the Mathematica podcast. This episode was produced by the inimitable Rick Stoddard. Subscribe for future episodes on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also learn more about the show by visiting us at mathematica.org slash on the evidence. Mm -hmm.